Hello, everyone. Yes, I know. It's been over a month since I, I've done Marvel Mondays. I, I, I realize that. I, I'm very terrible at, at keeping things consistent and maintaining a schedule. I know, I know, I know. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, I'm still not going to do uh, Marvel Mondays live yet um, because I still haven't seen Shang-Chi. So um, for the for the meantime, um, I'm still going to be doing these um, as recorded videos until I do see Shang-Chi. Um, but um. Uh, so as f for what if, um, you know, this is an anthology series. So, you know, each episode is its own self-contained story. Um, so far, you know, there isn't anything that's really connecting all these stories together. And with each episode only being 30 minutes, um, I'm thinking it, it might be better for me to wait until um, more episodes are out so I can talk about them all at once to have a longer discussion like I usually do. Or maybe it would be better if I um, did uh, talk about each episode individually and, you know, did shorter videos um, on each individual episode. So, you know, what do you guys think? Um, do you prefer these longer discussions or should I make shorter videos talking about each individual episode? Uh, post a comment, let me know what you think, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll either um, wait until the rest of the episodes are out to talk about them all, or, um, you know, talk about each episode each week um, based on your answers. And, and yes, I know the new episode comes out today. I'm not going to be talking about it because I'm recording this um, before I've even seen it. So, yeah, for, for now, this is just going to be about the first five episodes. So, without any more delay, let's get right into it. <clears throat> so the first episode of What If is uh, What If um, Peggy Carter Became uh, the First Avenger. And uh, it's basically, um, so instead of uh, Steve Rogers becoming Captain America, it's Peggy Carter, his love interest from the first Captain America movie, uh, becoming Captain Carter. And uh, for the most part, it's more or less the, the same from there um, as the original uh Captain America First Avenger movie, um, but I said mostly be because there are a few small differences. Um, first of all, um, Captain Carter actually manages to recover the Tesseract from a Hydra, so not only is their weaponry not as advanced as it was in the original movie, um, this means that Howard Stark, uh, Tony's father, was able to create the first Iron Man suit. And uh, in, in the episode, they call it the Hydra Smasher, though, which uh, makes sense. Um, but um, this alone um, is a big change, because if the first Iron Man suit was made during World War II, then imagine how much more advanced it would be um, by the time, you know, Tony Stark was born. And, of course, Tony Stark um, was old enough to use an Iron Man suit of his own, you know? I mean... Tony Stark's own Iron Man suit, you know, when, when he first built that was already, you know, way, technology way ahead of its time, you know, and that was made in present day. So imagine how far ahead of its time an Iron Man suit, you know, would be by the time we get to present day if the first one was built during World War II, you know. So that's the first uh, major change that, that that's um, in uh, the episode. The other one is that... um. On the mission where, where, where they infiltrate a Hydra train, Bucky doesn't fall to his supposed death and uh, thus um, doesn't become the Winter Soldier later on in life. Uh, they, they even <laughs> make a subtle reference. Well, maybe not so subtle, but yeah. They, they basically reference it by, by, by Bucky saying, you know, you almost pulled my arm off. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in reference to him getting a metal arm when he did become the... Uh, Winter Soldier in the main MCU universe. Now, I mentioned uh, the first Iron Man suit, the Hydra Stomper, before. Some people might be wondering if the Hydra Stomper is from the comics, and it's not. It's an original MCU creation, much like how uh, Miss Minutes from the Loki TV show is. Uh, I, I heard that, you know, Rob from Comics Explained said that the name is supposedly a reference to um, when Captain America in the comics was an agent for Hydra because he was referred to as the Stomper in that story. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a reference to that. It could be. very, It very well could be, but I, I'm not 100% certain about that. So the other major difference um, uh, from 
the original movie um, is that um, so instead of okay so I, I assume that because um, Bucky doesn't become the Winter Soldier um, Hydra has a different plan so to speak um, for how they're going to um, win the war um, you know excuse me they recover the Tesseract um, from from the train mission that I mentioned before, and they instead of using it for well, I actually don't really know what what Red Skull was going to use it for um, in the original movie because when he tries to escape with the Tesseract, you know, at the end of it, you know, he ends up getting sent to Vormir, um, as we know from Infinity War. So we we can't really say what. That we know what what Red Skull's plans for the Tesseract were um, beyond using it for uh, creating weapons, but uh, in the What If episode, um, he uses it to summon a giant tentacle monster um, from another dimension. Now, I'm not sure why he refers to it as Hydra's champion. You know, we don't really know how he knows about this creature, whatever it may be. Some people are saying that it's Shuma Gorath, um, who you might know if you've played. Um, you know, some of the Marvel vs. Capcom games, like Marvel vs. Capcom 2 or 3, or Marvel Super Heroes, or Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, you know, he was a playable character in those games. So, you might know Shumagorath from that more than you know from the comics, because Shumagorath hasn't been in the comics that much. But basically, he's this extremely powerful, insanely powerful, you know, cosmic being. He's taken over, you know, a couple of entire universes, you know, on his own. Like, like he's just that insanely powerful. And uh, he's typically a, a, an enemy of Doctor Strange. And it's rumored that he's going to be the villain in Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness. But as you probably know, I, I don't put much stock into rumors. So I'm not exactly taking that as a fact. Um, it's just a rumor. And that's it to me. But um, there's a couple of things... So yeah, th this this tentacle monster is sus suspected to be Shuma Gorath, but I'm not 100% cer certain that it is. Um, for one thing, um, so at the end of the episode, uh, Sharon basically sacrifices... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Captain Carter sacrifices herself um, to push the beast back into the portal where it came from. And um, basically, um, she winds up... Um, in modern day, much like how, how Steve Rogers, Captain America, uh, did after he was frozen in ice, only in, instead of being frozen in ice, of course, she was trapped inside of wherever that tentacle monster came from. And, and then, you know, when the Tesseract, you know, had, had, had reopened the portal um, back in modern day, you know, like in the first Avengers, instead of Loki coming out of the portal, it's Captain Carter and... A bunch of tentacles that she's cut off. Now, I would think that given how powerful Shuma Gorath is, if it really was him, then he would have easily destroyed Captain Carter because, you know, he's this insanely powerful cosmic being, you know? So I, I would think that she would not be able to survive a one-on-one -on -one battle with him, you know? And um, so, so, so that's one of the reasons why I don't necessarily think that, that it might be Shuma Gorath. Um, but there, I don't know, it, there's still a possibility that it might be, <laughs> um, and, and I'll get to that later. But, um, so yeah, so that's basically um, what happened in the episode and my thoughts on it. Um, I thought it was pretty good, even if the changes were minimal at best. Honestly, the biggest changes um, that came out of that episode are things that we didn't see. Like, we didn't see Bucky become the Winter Soldier, so, again... Um, Hydra didn't have their, you know, their top assassin who, who would carry out their most secretive and, and you know, and important missions, you know, after, um, you know, Hydra re was reformed under S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, because as we know in the main MCU, um, you know, the Winter Soldier, Bucky, what was their, their main guy for, for doing those things. But without him, you know, what did they do? You know, like, like who did they use? You know, like... Exactly how did they carry out their most important plans if they were able to at all, you know, did S.H.I.E.L.D. even, was Hydra even reborn under S.H.I.E.L.D. in, in this universe? You know what I mean? Like, like, 
that that right there is a big change along with again um the first iron man suit being created during world war ii and all the technological advancements that come from that so yeah um, i would like to see this timeline continue if for no other reason to see how different things are just from those two things alone there might be more things um that aren't coming to my mind immediately uh that are also different uh, as a result of the changes however small they may be um that happened in this episode so that was episode one episode two is what if t'challa became a star lord so basically t'challa black panther uh in star lord's role and um now this episode is, is is very different from 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 the first one. While the first one was more or less the first Avenger again, but with um, Peggy Carter in in, in um, Steve's role, um, T'Challa in Star Lord's role is not Guardians of the Galaxy again, but with T'Challa instead of uh, Peter Quill. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, in the first place, um, when we see um, that that scene, that famous scene from the first uh, Guardians movie where um, T'Challa uh, gets the, the the orb that contains the Power Stone, um, when he's confronted by Korath and his troops, um, he doesn't wonder, you know, who's Star Lord. He actually knows who Star Lord is. Like, like he's basically, you know, as well known as Peter Quill wanted to be. Um, when, when, when he said, my name is Star-Lord in the first Guardians, you know, and, and I actually like, you know, the idea behind, you know, T'Challa actually being well, well known as Star-Lord as opposed to <laughs> Peter Quill, who, who really didn't become famous until after the Guardians of the Galaxy were, were formed. So the entire idea behind this is that when, when, T'Challa was picked up by, by the Ravengers uh, accidentally be, because they mistook him for Quill because, you know, all humans look alike, <laughs> according to the Ravengers. Um, for some reason, they don't re return him to, to his home planet, but decide to take him on a journey through the stars. And I imagine what happened what, was that T'Challa managed to convince the Ravengers to be good, hence why they're now under his leadership instead of Yondu's. Um, in fact, um, and this surprised me very much, but, but Satala actually managed to turn Thanos into a good guy in this universe. Now, now some people are finding it rather unbelievable that, that you know, T'Challa could talk Thanos out of killing half the universe with the Infinity Gauntlet. But I could see, you know, a couple of ways in which T'Challa, through conversation, could convince Thanos that... His plan is not as well thought out as he seems to think it is. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, so, because Thanos became good, we assume, we, we can assume from this that, um, so, so first of all, we, <laughs> uh, we, we see Nebula in this episode, and she's not a cyborg. The, the only cybernetic part of her body is one of her eyes. But um, other than that, she's, Basically, you know, completely, her entire body is all natural, which means that um, T'Challa must have convinced Thanos um, early on enough that he didn't even, you know, torture Nebula, you know, into, you know, becoming a cyborg, you know, because the whole reason why he did that is to, is because every time when he would, he would have Gamora and Nebula fight, it was to test to see which one was better, and Nebula always lost, so he would, you know, basically implement, use cybernetic, cy cybernetic implants to improve Nebula, to, to make her a better fighter, you know, she's, you know, she's not a cyborg anymore, it, or rather, she never became a cyborg in this universe, so, you know, again, we can assume that, that, you know, T'Challa convinced Thanos early on not to be a good guy so you know yeah and and also um we don't see gamora in this episode which means that not only did t'challa convince thanos to, to to not be a genocidal maniac early on enough to not give nebula cybernetic implants but he also assumedly never went to gamora's planet in the first place and adopted her so you know who knows where gamora is or what she's doing in, in, in this universe you know <clears throat> so, 
the, the main plot of this episode is um, T'Challa and Nebula plan to go to the Collector to steal an artifact called the Ember of Genesis, which is capable of eradicating galactic hunger. So, you know, and, and you know, like I said, T'Challa basically um, reformed the Ravengers into being good guys. Excuse me. So this would be their way of, um, you know, you know, taking from the wealthy and giving to the rich, you know, a means of, of feeding everybody in the galaxy and whatnot. So they go to the collector and, and, you know, they have this elaborate plan to, you know, get inside and, and, you know, take, take the ember of, of Genesis. And, um, what, what ends up happening is we actually see the collector fight. And, uh, we also see Howard the duck for a short amount of time as well. And, um, we actually see in this universe that the collector has actually collo <laughs> collected uh, a lot of the artifacts from other characters across the MCU. So we see him; he has he's got Captain America's shield, and he's also um, he also uh, has um, Hela's helmet somehow, which apparently the helmet is the source of her power, which is how she's able to pull swords out of thin air. So. Because that's what we see the collector do when he wears it, and um, let me tell you, I actually enjoyed seeing the co the collector fight. Like, you know, <laughs> in in the comics, you know, so so he's part of um, I forgot what the group is called. He's like the last of, one of the few members that's the last of his race or, or or something. They're like millions of years old beings, you know, like the Grand Master, the collector. The warrior, the gardener, and so on. You know, the, these are all guys that are millions and millions of years old. Like, like they were old when the universe was young. Like these guys are so old. So, the fact that we haven't really been able to see that yet in in the MCU makes the fact that we finally get to see you know Collector active in combat. You know, it, really cool. Uh, now, um, <laughs> I did admittedly. Um, <coughs> When I talked about the What If series um, early on um, in, in previous what, um, Marvel discussions, uh, I, I suspected that it might be possible that, um, that all of these episodes, despite being self-contained, might end up being connected to one another somehow, you know, by the end of the season. Um, and that could still very well happen. And, you know, I'll, I'll touch upon that again later. But another theory that I came up with um, later on was the possibility that the plot twist of the season is going to be that all of these alternate universes are actually taking place in the same alternate universe. Um, but that's not really possible because uh, the What If Zombies episode alone contradicts every other episode. Like, you, you can't have, you know, a universe where the heroes become zombies and also a universe, you know, like it's the same, also the same universe where, where the first Avenger was Captain Carter and also um, where, where T'Challa became Star-Lord. So, you know, just the what if zombies episode alone contradicts that entire theory. But even if it didn't, um, this episode contradicts that theory because, um, like, like I said, you know, the first episode was about Captain Carter, you know, becoming the first Avenger, which means that she doesn't have the same shield that Captain America has. It has, you know, the British flag on it instead of, of you know, the red, white, and blue with a star in the center. And uh, in this episode, like I said, we see a whole bunch of items that the Collector has collected throughout the universe, and Captain America's shield is one of those items. So, obviously, you can't have Captain America and Captain Carter exist at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's just not, that's not possible. So, yeah. So, anyway, um, you know, the Collector and T'Challa, you know, they fight. Eventually, T'Challa and, and Yondu team up against him and they win. Um, now, uh, during the escape, after they get the Ember of Genesis and, you know, they try to escape from the Collector's place and whatnot, um, Thanos ends up needing to fight, um, um, what, what is it, guy? I, I think it's Supergiant or Call Obsidian. What, what, it, I forget which one of those, it's the, you know, the big guy with the hammer, you know, and, and he, he ends up needing to fight him, 
and, and also Proximity Midnight uh, joins in with the fight as well. Now, you know, of course, at first, you know, they don't stand a chance against Thanos because he's incredibly strong and incredibly durable. But somehow, Proxima Midnight Spear manages to, you know, put up a fair fight against him. And I wasn't sure at first if that's really accurate because, again, Thanos is really strong and really durable. So I looked it up, and as it turns out, Proximate Midnight Spear is made from a sun trapped inside of a distorted space-time. So it acts as a, um, a star, a supernova, and a black hole all at the same time. So after, you know, looking it up, you know, I think it's safe to say that, yeah, some, something that powerful could potentially, you know, incapacitate Thanos or at least inconvenience him, you know? So... You know, at first I, I, I found it to be questionable, but once I actually looked into it, it, it seemed more believable. And then, of course, at the end of the episode, we see where Peter Quill is in this universe. And as it turns out, obviously, he's been living on Earth all this time, you know, since he wasn't uh, taken by the Ravengers. But at this point in time, you know, because 20 years pass uh, between... Um, T'Challa being picked up from Earth because he's taken as a kid. And, and of course, 20 years past, he's an adult now. So, of course, Peter Quill is an adult by this time. And uh, Ego actually manages to find him and, um, you know, basically says, you know, it, it's time to, you, you met your father or, or whatever it is that he says. <laughs> so, so, so basically, yeah, <laughs> considering, you know, what Ego's intentions are and, and you know, what he plans to do with Peter, this, you know, as the Watcher puts it, could spell the end of humanity. But man, does this ending make me want to see this timeline continue. My God, you have no idea how much I want to see this timeline continue just from the ending alone, man. Like, can you imagine, you know, T'Challa, Star-Lord, and the Ravengers featuring Thanos versus Ego and his son, Peter Quill? My God, I would love to see that fight. Oh my God, that would be so amazing. You guys have no idea how much. Like, I really want to see th th this this universe continue. Like, you have no idea how much I want to see this universe continue. Like, at the very least, th this alternate timeline, this alternate reality could be good enough to act as its own movie, if not its own series. So, man, I, man, you have no idea how much I want to see this universe continue. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. So. So then. <laughs> so the next episode is. Um, okay. So this this next <laughs> episode three is um, what if um, the Avengers had been killed? So um, it starts from the part in Iron Man two where uh, Nick Fury and Tasha Romanoff, Black Widow, um, you know. When they talk to uh, Tony Stark at the donor shop, you know, during that scene in Iron Man 2, when um, Natasha gives uh, Tony that injection, you know, to, to help him with um, the palladium poisoning that, that he's undergoing. But uh, instead of curing him, he somehow ends up being killed. And, um, you know, of course, Natasha Romanoff is suspected to have murdered Tony Stark, even though, you know, she obviously didn't like there's no way she could have known that that would kill him you know it, it's a big mystery as to how this could have happened but of course um fury believes her and when, when she says that she didn't kill him and and trusts her to investigate what really happened and to find out who the killer really is um so while that's going on um this is also uh, taking place at the same time as when thor's hammer arrived on earth and of course thor himself came to retrieve it. Now, Thor is uh, human at, at the time of his own movie, if you remember, uh, because he was deemed unworthy by his father and cast out from Asgard. And, and so, you know, he came to retrieve his hammer. And, um, you know, if you remember <coughs> from Thor's first movie, um, you know, Clint Barton, Hawkeye, um, took aim at him, you know, and was ready to shoot if he needed to. Um, in, you know, in case the order 
was given or whatnot. But of course, he was told to hold his fire and, and, and to wait. But something happens that causes him to shoot his arrow anyway, and this ends up killing Thor. Now, while Clint is in his cell, um, in his cell, wondering, you know, why that happened, because he doesn't make mistakes, um, he doesn't miss, he doesn't misfire. Um, you know, while he's wondering that, you know, Fury and Coulson are having a discussion about, you know, what happened, and Fury suspects that whoever killed Tony Stark is also responsible for the death of Thor. Um, and then w when they go to talk to Barton in his cell, they find him dead as well. Um, now, of course, obviously, um, <laughs> it's impossible for him to have killed himself um, because he was under heavy watch. Um, you know, he was in a cell where, where like everybody was watching him and there's security cameras inside the cell as well. So th there's no way that he could have killed himself, which, of course, adds to the mystery of, you know, who killed him, why and who's doing it. Um, but Fury suspects that it's the same person. Wait, I just said that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, um, while Natasha Romanoff is investigating uh, th these mysterious deaths, um, she finds um, where Bruce Banner is hiding. And while that is going on, um, Loki actually comes to Earth to avenge his brother's death. Uh, and of course, he uses the casket of Winters to, um, to uh, threaten Earth basically with war. And um, Fury tries to make a deal with Loki. Um, <clears throat> You know, basically promising that he'll find his brother's killer, and Loki gives him until sunrise um, to do so. Now, while that's going on, um, Natasha Romanoff, as I said, uh, finds Bruce Banner. And uh, this is, of course, during the events of the Incredible Hulk movie that nobody remembers. And um, when General Ross shows up to um, capture Bruce Banner, he, of course, transforms into the Hulk and fights the army. But... For some reason, you know, something happens to him that causes him to increase in size and he basically explodes. And this catches his girlfriend Betty Ross by surprise because, you know, both he and um, Betty believe, you know, Banner and Betty both believed that Bruce couldn't die. Excuse me. So, of course, um, Betty is taken by surprise from the fact that, you know, he, he literally just died, you know. So... You know, obviously, there's no way of knowing what could have caused this. Um, and with Natasha Romanoff, the one investigating all these murders, uh, being the last one left, um, she actually manages to find um, the source of, of, you know, why these murders are happening. And before she gets killed, she manages to leave what ends up being a cryptic message uh, for Fury. Um, she says it's all about hope and... She manages to send that message to Fury, um, who listens to it multiple times on repeat, trying to figure out what it means. And he actually considers at some point calling Captain Marvel to help um, with their current situation. But just before he does so, he actually manages to figure out the, me the meaning behind um, Natasha's message and uh, meets with Loki to, to make a deal with him. So at the grave of Hope Van Dyne, uh, Hank Pym's uh, daughter, um, <clears throat> apparently she was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and um, she died on a mission and uh, Hank Pym blames um, uh, S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, specifically Nick Fury, for her death. Uh, and uh, that's why, you know, using not the Ant-Man suit, but rather the Yellow Jacket suit, you know, we, we assume that, you know, the combination of his daughter dying as well as the Pym particles messing with his mind, uh, that he basically went crazy and decided to kill um, all of Nick Fury's uh, candidates for the Avengers initiative. And uh, and uh, so that that's, you know, that's who is behind all the murders and that's why, you know, he did it. And um, the reason why he killed Thor is because he believed that he would have been recruited for the Avengers initiative as well. Now, uh, Fury and, and, and Hank all ha end up having a fight, and it turns out that Fury is actually Loki in disguise and uh, manages to defeat Hank, and they arrest him, you know, for the murders and everything. And um, 
Of course, Nick Fury has to come up with a backup plan for the Avengers Initiative, especially since Loki um, ended up uh, not holding, holding up his end of the bargain and instead of leaving Earth, uh, decided to stay and assert himself as the new ruler of the planet. So now Fury's got to take care of that, but he's got no team to assemble in order to uh, do so. But there's one Avenger that um, Hank didn't kill, and it's Captain America, who at this time was still frozen in ice and hadn't been discovered yet. So Nick Fury uh, goes on to discover Captain America. And of course, he has, of course, at this point, actually called Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, to Earth. And um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean... To me, it seems like Carol would be enough to take on Loki's army, but at the same time, it is an army, and while he may not have the Tesseract, you know, I don't know. It would be interesting to see uh, Captain America and Captain Marvel uh, take on Loki's army uh, to try to take back Earth, and um, just from that alone, I, I would like to see how, how this storyline continues, as well as... Um, what this new Avengers team would be, um, considering how none of the original members besides Cap uh, are a part of it, you know? So, you know, the fact that all of the original members of the Avengers besides Cap are gone, and plus, you know, Carol would have to be, you know, a regular member of the team, despite, you know, being in other parts of the universe, um, you know, yeah. It would be interesting to see how, how, how this universe continues, you know, again, j just to see, um, you know, who the replacement Avengers would end up being, you know, like, like the Falcon would probably still end up being a member and, and likely War Machine as well. But other than those two, um, there's not really uh, that many people I can think of off the top of my head who would uh, replace uh, the Avengers uh, in this universe. So... That, that, that episode was really good as well, and uh, it was my favorite one of, of the season so far until episode four happened. Oh boy, episode four, let me tell you, uh, episode four was really something else, okay? So in this episode, um, it's uh, what if uh, Doctor Strange lost his heart instead of his hands? And in this episode, um, basically what ends up happening is... Um, uh, so if you remember in the first Doctor Strange movie, um, he gets into a car accident, which results in him losing his hands. Like he can't perform surgery anymore. That's what causes him to go to Carmitage and e eventually ends up becoming Sorcerer Supreme. In this universe, his girlfriend is with him uh, in the car w when the accident happens. So instead of um, Stephen Strange uh, getting injuries that result in him losing his hands, um, his girlfriend dies in a car crash instead. But other than that, um, things largely play out the same. Um, he goes to Kamataj, you know, becomes the source of Supreme, saves the world from Dormammu, etc., etc. But at some point, um, he decides to go back in time and try to save Christine's life. Um, so that, you know, basically it's as if she never died. So Doctor Strange um, <clears throat> goes back in time to try to prevent um, his girlfriend from dying. Um, but no matter how many times he does it, um, no matter you know what changes he makes, you know any changes in plans, any any change at all to try to prevent her from dying, she ends up dying no matter what. And um, this ends up uh, driving him crazy. And eventually, what happens is the Ancient One comes to him and says that. Um, Christine's death is an absolute uh, point in time that cannot be changed and, um, you know, basically telling him to, to give up and, and stop trying to um, change the past. And uh, this leads to a fight between um, the Ancient One and Doctor Strange and um, something happens, but we're not sure what it is uh, at the time. Um, but basically, um, Doctor Strange ends up... Um, I forgot what the, what the name of this place was, but uh, basically um, he ends up um, somewhere where he meets um, another, um, you know, wise being who, um, 
you know, teaches him about powerful magic. You know, I, I forgot this guy's name. Um, excuse me. I've only seen episode four um, and five uh, once, as opposed to the episode, uh, the first three episodes, which I've watched twice. So I don't remember um, all of the details that clearly. So I apologize for um, how badly I'm butchering um, this uh, plot summary right now. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, basically, um, <clears throat> th this guy is supposedly, you know, is capable of knowing, um, how to change, um, absolute points of time that cannot be changed or whatever. So Dr. Strange, um, tries to, uh, learn how to become powerful enough to do so. And he does this by, um, absorbing various uh, mystical beings. And, um, the first one that he tries to absorb is actually... Uh, the same tentacle monster that we saw in the first episode. And this is the first um, way in which um, the episodes of What If are connected to one another. Well, not exactly... Um, I forgot to mention this when, when talking about episode 3. Um, so basically, episode 3 is the first time that we actually see um, the Watcher uh, somewhere in the background... Um, during a scene in, in one of these episodes. And it happens again in this episode, but this time we actually see um, the Watcher himself uh, talking about what's happening in this universe he's observing. Uh, so um, after Doctor Strange um, opens up a portal that, that brings forth uh, the tentacle beast from episode one, you know, again, it may or may not be Shuma Gorath. Um, it, I don't want to get my hopes up and say that it is, but it might be, you know, because even, like, I, I don't imagine that th they would have it show up twice, you know, if it wasn't going to be important. You know, it, it is possible that it's not Shuma Gorath, but just some generic tentacle monster or something. Um, but, again, I believe that, you know, if it wasn't important, you know, if it wasn't the same one, then they wouldn't have brought it back. But, you know, there's still some plausible deniability about whether or not, you know, this beast of Shuma Gorath. Anyway, um, the beast ends up being too powerful for Doctor Strange to absorb, so he instead goes for smaller creatures first. And then eventually, you know, he summons the tentacle monster again. But this time, you know, closes the portal immediately to cut off its tentacles and just absorbs the tentacles instead. Uh, you know, so as Doctor Strange is absorbing all of these uh, different mystical beings and, you know, becoming more powerful as he does so, you know, the Watcher is commenting on, you know, how what this Doctor Strange is doing will eventually lead to the destruction of his universe and how he could intervene to stop it. But, you know, it's not worth the, risking the other universes just to save this one. And um, so that's basically, you know, one of the things, you know, that that's basically the primary trait of the Watchers in general, you know. They're, they're these insanely powerful beings that are capable of doing great things, you know. Like, like they're very, very powerful cosmic beings. But um, because of their history in the comics, like, I, I forget exactly what happened that, that caused them to take a vow of non inter non-intervention, that, um, you know, basically, they, they, they've taken an oath to only observe and, and document, but, but never to intervene, you know. So anyway, um, as this version of Doctor Strange, um, you know, becomes more and more powerful, he attempts to, um, you know, turn back time again, you know, to, to save his girlfriend's life. And um, as this is happening, um, reality is falling apart basically. And, um, as it turns out, um, what, ha what ended up happening in the fight between Dr. Strange and the ancient one is she ended up splitting the two Dr. Stranges, which created two timelines. One where Dr. Strange used the time stone to try to s go back in time and save Christine's life. And one where, um, he didn't. So, so basically, um, the Doctor Strange, who decided not to go back in time, uh, he ends up going up, going outside, and and seeing that you know reality is falling apart, and it's because, of course, of the evil Doctor Strange who um, is trying to save Christine's life. 
So the, the Ancient One comes to the good Doctor Strange and explains to him what, what's happening and, you know, what's going on. And uh, she, she refers to, um, she, she basically calls what's happening a temporal paradox. And they don't explain this part in the episode, but basically what's happening is, you know, it's basically the grandfather paradox. You know, if you don't know what that is, uh, basically um, what, what happened was uh, Chris, Dr. Strange's girlfriend, Christine, died. Uh, he went to go on to become Sorcerer Supreme because of it. You know, he went to Kamachash, save the world, and then he ended up going back in time to try to save her life. But if he saves her life, that means he never went to Kamataj, became the Sorcerer Supreme, and thus he never went back in time to save her. So, yeah, it's, it's a contradiction. You know, the, this is the paradox that, that the Ancient One is referring to. You know, Doctor Strange couldn't have gone back in time uh, to save Christine's life in the first place, you know, if... Yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, so, so that's basically why reality is falling apart. So with a protection spell from the Vestanti that, that Wong gives Doctor Strange, um, the, the good Doctor Strange um, basically it is summoned by the, the evil one, you know, and, and basically the evil one tries to absorb him so that way he can be whole and again and thus, you know, powerful enough to, to do what he wants, which is, you know, bring Christine back to life. And... Uh, in the end, um, the evil Doctor Strange actually ends up winning, and uh, he, you know, reforms, uh, you know, he binds his other self to him, and, uh, you know, this allows him to bring Christine back, but of course, um, reality is falling apart, so it's a short-lived reunion, and uh, not only does Christine end up dying anyway, but the whole universe ends up being destroyed, and the evil Doctor Strange is the only one left in, in his own reality. So, yeah, it's it's a very grim, very sad and tragic ending to a very sad and tragic episode. It's it's really it's really something like like um <laughs> like yeah, it, it's a very heavy episode to to, to put it one way. It's. I would say it's easily, um, like, I thought, you know, episode three w was the best one so far, but this one, whew, wow, like, this one was absolutely amazing, like, man, like, I don't know, you know, how they could do better than this, you know, for the rest of the season, like, like I, I'm just, I'm not really sure how they can make a better episode than this one, you know, with, with, what else they have left like it's just oh my god it's just wow like i'm at a loss for words to describe how 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 awesome it is it's just this episode was absolutely brilliant it was mind-blowingly amazing <sighs> and um you know obviously with the, the destruction of this universe um it doesn't seem like there's any sort of way to have this Doctor Strange's story continue, but um, I wouldn't count him out just yet because I actually believe that it's actually possible that we might see this Doctor Strange in Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. You know, maybe, possibly. It is dealing with the multiverse, so don't exactly count this Doctor Strange out just because his universe was destroyed, you know. With how powerful he has become, it is possible that he'll find some way to escape his own destroyed reality and, you know, find a new place to uh, make his home, or whatever have you. So the last one is, um, the la what are we up to right now um, with What If, uh, besides the new episode that just came out today? is uh, What If Zombies? And, uh, you know, uh, I thought this episode w was was pretty good as well. Um, not as good as episode three or four, of course, but, um, you know, about as good as episode two. Um, excuse me. So basically, you know, the story starts at basically when um, Avengers Infinity War happens. Um, Hulk gets sent to Earth, uh, becomes Bruce Banner again, uh, only this time, instead of being greeted by Doctor Strange and Wong, he uh, finds himself alone, and New York City is empty. You know, he's wondering what's going on. Where is everybody? 
but then Thanos's henchmen uh, uh, I, I I can't remember if his name is Supergiant or 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 Call Obsidian, but again, it, it's the big guy, and um, and uh, <laughs> why 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 can't I remember his name? The the psychic guy who looks like Squidward, you know, it's it's him and, and the big guy with the hammer. They, they they come to Earth and you know give the whole speech, you know that they gave at the beginning of Infinity War when they came to Earth. But then a portal opens up behind them and, and Iron Man blasts them with an iron blast. But things are not as it seems because, you know, as as they are fighting um, Thanos' henchmen, they eventually start eating them. And that's when we find out that they're actually zombies. You know, Tony Stark and Doctor Strange and Wong are, are, are zombies. And, um, you know, of course, um, Bruce Banner is telling Hulk to come out, but as you remember from Infinity War, um, Hulk didn't want to become Hulk anymore um, after after um, getting his ass beat by Thanos. So, of course, it doesn't happen, but luckily... Um, oh, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Marvel Zombies, um, the superheroes and villains um, still remember how to use the superpowers even after they become zombies. So, um, yeah, that... that obviously makes them a very big threat even though they're undead at this point you know they're not your typical zombies they're zombies with superpowers so um basically it seems like hulk is or, or rather bruce banner is uh, about to be eaten because of course you know uh you know <laughs> when you're dealing with zombies with superpowers it's kind of unavoidable especially when one of them has psychic powers that you're going to get eaten by them but all of a sudden he's saved by what appear at first, at least to me, to be uh, locusts who eat the zombies, uh, but as it turns out, they're ants, and um, he, he's being saved by um, Hope, who, who is, uh, of course, commanding the, the ants, and, uh, you know, she saves uh, Banner, uh, and, and Spider-Man does as well, and um, so, so basically they explain what happened, and, um, well, actually, we're, we're told by the Watcher what, how the zombie apocalypse happened, um, while, while Spider-Man and Hope uh, tell Banner what's going on. So the way um, how the zombie apocalypse happens explained to us is basically during the events of Ant-Man and the Wasp, um, when, when, when Hank goes to, um, uh, to the quantum realm to, to, to save his wife, um, he finds her, but apparently she, she contracted a, a quantum virus that turned her into a zombie. So when Hank returned, um, to um, his home dimension, you know, he, of course, had become a zombie as well, since, of course, he was bitten by her, and uh, he ends up uh, biting Scott Lang, a man who, you know, in turn, of course, also becomes a zombie, but, but Hope manages to make her escape as the Wasp. Um, and so, yeah, basically, the Avengers are called in to um, handle um, the zombie outbreak, and um, they end up getting bitten as well, because, of course, you know, when one of the zombies is so small that you can't even see him, it's very easy to get bitten and just catch the zombie infection yourself, even if you're a superhero. So, you know, with the Avengers having turned in, in, into zombies, you know, there's basically, you know, no hope left for humanity except for the few surviving members, which include, um, as we've already mentioned, uh, Hope, the Wasp, uh, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, um, Bucky, uh, Okoye, Sharon Carter, Happy, and Kurt, who is uh, one of the three guys from Scott Lane's circle of friends from, you know, the two Ant-Man movies. You know, the, the, those three guys, you know, that are running their own small business after Scott gets out of jail in the first movie. Yeah, he's one of those three. You know, just because <laughs> I imagine a lot of people probably didn't remember that character, you know, if they even saw the Ant-Man movies. So, you know, just to clear up the confusion as to who he was and why he was in the episode, you know. So, you know, they explain, you know, you know what, what's going on. And uh, basically, they, they learn that a potential cure is at the camp in New, New Jersey where... Uh, uh, it's 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 at the play it's at the military base in New Jersey where um, Captain America and Black Widow went to during Captain America the Winter Soldier um, where they learned about Hydra's plans and whatnot and uh, yeah so basically they they need to find a way to get there because apparently there's a potential cure there 
Now, uh, during the process of trying to get find their way to New Jersey, um, Happy dies, uh, Sharon Carter dies, um, you know, she gets bitten by a zombie, and, um, you know, on the, they, they, they take a train, a subway train, you know, um, you know, they get attacked by zombie Falcon, who, who ends up being killed, um, you know, Captain America zombie, you know, gets on the train, you know, he gets cut in half, and he gets left behind, uh, and, of course, Bucky, um, takes Cap's shield, you know, Hope ends up getting infected because uh, she she killed Sharon Carter zombie by uh, shrieking down and expand re expanding you know while she was inside of her and she ends up having a, a cut on her shoulder which is how she gets infected. Um, they arrive at the New Jersey base, but um, they're not able to to get there um, because it's between the the train that they're on and um, a field of zombies and. Um, uh, Hope decides to sacrifice herself by uh, turning big and carrying the rest of the surviving crew uh, across the field of zombies to make it to the base. But um, she she ends up, you know, she ends, she lets them down and ends up passing out um, in the field. And um, the heroes start to wonder why the zombies aren't climbing the fence. But then they see that there's, you know a hole in the fence, which means that they don't have to get over anything in order to get in there, but they're still not, you know, going after them. So they're wondering what's going on. And that's when they find Vision, um, who, who's been at the base. And uh, as Vision explains it, um, apparently the zombie virus is some kind of neurodegenerative disease or something like that. I don't know. It, it's something that affects the brain that, that, you know, turns them into zombies. And it's because Vision has the Mind Stone that he's able to, you know, effectively control the zombies and, and keep them away from the base. Uh, and in fact, he could theoretically, you know, with the power of his own Mind Stone, you know, cure this uh, brain disease uh, that, that's causing everybody to become zombies. And in fact, he had already done so uh, with Scott Lang, Ant-Man, who is uh, revealed to be, you know, just a head now. And, um... Yeah, it's very weird. Um, so, um, so Bucky goes around l looking in the base, um, trying to see w what's going on here, and he ends up finding. Uh, well, he he finds two things. Uh, he finds Scarlet Witch, and he finds T'Challa with his leg cut off. Uh, that's actually a thing that happens in the Marvel Zombies uh, comics, by the way. Um, T'Challa was also uh, being used for uh, zombie food. Um, uh, in, in the comics. Um, at first, when, when, when T'Challa is found, um, I thought what had happened was that um, he had gotten bitten, but um, they were able to keep him from turning into a zombie by, by cutting off his leg, um, you know, before the virus could spread or whatnot. But no, as it turns out, um, you know, because, of course, Vision is in love with Scarlet Witch, um, she... Uh, he was keeping her alive and fed because he couldn't bring himself to, to kill her. Uh, so, of course, he, he, he lured uh, T'Challa there um, to, you know, use him as zombie food. Uh, so, um, she manages to, to, to break out of her containment and, uh, you know, Kurt and Okoye end up dying. Um, Vision uh, basically sacrifices himself to, to give the heroes the, the Mind Stone so that way they could create a cure because uh, Wakanda is the only place left on Earth where there isn't a zombie infection going on because um, one, it's concealed, and two, they have a barrier that keeps people out. So, uh, you know, that's basically where they're going to take the Mind Stone in, in order to uh, create a cure, you know. So, you know... Uh, Hulk ends up uh, sacrificing himself uh, to, uh, you know, allow the heroes to escape. Um, apparently, um, you know, Hulk's skin is thick enough that he's able to prevent himself from being bitten, but we don't actually see the Hulk and Scarlet Witch uh, fight each other, just the surviving heroes escaping. And uh, just, just as it seems like they're about to get away... Um, uh, Hope Van Dyme comes back as a zombie, and of course she was still giant um, when she turned, so um, she actually almost manages to, to stop them from escaping, but 
they actually managed to uh, make it out alive anyway. And uh, the last surviving members are, of course, Spider-Man, Black Panther, and uh, Head, Ant-Man, who, who is using Doctor Strange's Cloak of Levitation to uh, keep himself afloat. So the episode ends with them, you know, landing in Wakanda and, uh, you know, things seem hopeful. Um, well, not really, because, uh, you know, there's a zombie outbreak and all that. And Vision did mention that his Mind Stone only acts as a theoretical cure, even though he managed to cure uh, Scott Lang. But um, as it turns out, um, <laughs> zombie Thanos uh, still somehow managed to assemble... Um, almost every other piece of the Infinity Gauntlet and has come to Earth uh, for the Mind Stone. So, uh, yeah, things are not looking great for, for humanity anyway. Um, <clears throat> it's overall a, a very weird episode and certainly a, a weird ending. Um, <laughs> like, um, knowing uh, how to still use your superpowers even as a zombie is one thing, but how to still use the Infinity Stone as a zombie... I mean, I guess it's not that much of a stretch, but, um, yeah, still overall, like I said, very weird episode and ending, but, um, still pretty good nonetheless. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure, you know, like, obviously there's still potential for a continuation of this storyline, but I'm not really sure, um, where the story could go from here, you know, other than perhaps, uh, a different version of... Infinity War and Endgame, where, you know, there's a zombie outbreak, uh, or, I don't know, m maybe they somehow managed to, uh, get the cure to work and cure the whole planet, excuse me, but then, you know, even if that happens, you know, how are they going to deal with Thanos? He already has five to six Infinity Stones, so at that point, it would be pretty much, you know, all for nothing, so... You know, I don't know. It would be curious to see how this uh, storyline would continue. But again, I can't, I don't have any ideas in my mind about how it could potentially uh, play out. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's um, basically the, the first uh, entire half season of, of What If, how it's played out so far. And uh, so far, um, I, I actually uh, like it very much. Um, I, it didn't necessarily have uh, the strongest start because while episode one w was good, it, it didn't change that much uh, from uh, the original movie it's based off of. Uh, episode two was way better and way different. And uh, of course, it only got better from there. Uh, the series, as I said, peaked at um, episode four, which, you know, I don't know how they're going to potentially do better than that. Apparently, one of the episodes... Um, is about uh, Vision and Ultron fusing together and having the Infinity Gauntlet. And I think that's going to be the last episode of the season, which, you know, if there's any episode that has the potential to be better than episode four, it's that one. So we'll see what happens and, and how the rest of the series plays out. So, uh, yeah, that, that's going to be it for um, this episode of, uh, you know, my, my discussions of, you know, what if... Um, like I said, uh, leave a comment if you will want me to uh, continue to, uh, if you want me to wait until the end of the season to talk about the rest of the episodes, or if you would prefer uh, I have shorter discussions by, uh, you know, talking about individual episodes on a weekly basis instead. And if you guys prefer that I, uh, I do shorter weekly episodes, then um, I think I'll record and upload uh, my uh, video about uh, what if episode six uh, this weekend uh, rather than waiting for the the entire rest of the season to play out. So yeah, um, thank you all for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, little discussion talk that I had about um, my thoughts on what if so far. And uh, yeah, like I said, don't forget to leave the feedback and like like that I <laughs> that I'm asking for like the video if you liked it. Be sure to subscribe if you enjoy the content. And yeah. Um, I'll see you guys uh, either, I don't know, after this series is over or this weekend, depending on the feedback you give. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for watching and see you next time.